Hey there, nerds. Jimmy Blomquist here, and I have a super special guest. Now, it's been a while. We interviewed him about two years ago, uh, and I went back and looked, and I couldn't believe it was that long ago, so clearly I'm getting old. But today we have Justin Zimmerman, a very, very good friend from my days back at film school at Ohio University. So, Justin, welcome. And thanks so much for having me. You know, I don't actually remember the last interview at all, which says nothing good about my memory or myself. So, uh, but I, I, it's always great to talk to you. Well, it's funny. I went back and looked at it, so I didn't repeat any um, questions. I'm like, wow, uh, this was way longer ago than I thought. Because I was thinking, oh, we did a couple months ago, maybe a year. It's like May 2012. Holy crap! Whew, getting old. Uh, so anyway. Uh, Tell us a little bit about yourself, Justin. I know last time you wanted to go third person and talk about yourself, so I'm going to put you a little bit on the spot. Who are you, Justin? (laughs) Yeah, my least favorite thing besides turning my own voice is talking about myself. But I, I, uh, you know, I got my master's degree. uh, I don't know how long ago it was now, man, 11, 12 years ago when I met a a young and almost incredibly handsome uh, gentleman named Jimmy Pompkins. But um, <laughs> but since then, man, I just bop around quite a bit. I, I do documentary work. Um, I do narrative work. I work – I've taught in four colleges. I um, write comics, and I work for uh, Getting Images and, and Cisco Systems uh, in a bunch of different capacities, always as an independent, but – from project managing to writing storyboards to doing film work. So I've just kind of rotated through uh, creative and corporate uh, work for, you know, over a decade now. And that keeps me hopefully um, interesting and, and keeps my work interesting as well. Well, it keeps you humble because you didn't mention you're a nationally recognized writer, filmmaker, and professor. <laughs> nationally well, I mean, recognized. Well, I'm cool. always impressed with that. Well, what's cool in this day and age, and, and I mean, you've got to know this, is that your work can go far beyond you, and I actually prefer that. I, I like my work to speak for itself. Nobody besides you, because you're so nice, actually wants to listen to me uh, prattle on and on. But, you know, I've, I've had a film on national public television. I've had films in film festivals across the, the country and, in a couple cases, the, the world. And, and most of that time, it was work that was created just for the sake of making the work. It wasn't for a company. It wasn't for money. It was to make something neat because it, it could be made. Um, and I've been really lucky to meet a, a number of people throughout the course of my, my career who are as invested in making neat stuff as they are making an in for themselves or, or making a bunch of bucks. And that's been, you know, it's it's a neat day and age to be involved in technology and storytelling. I will say you are by far one of the most passionate uh, I won't. I won't put you in a niche. Passionate creators will say um, I've ever met. I remember way back in film school, you were working on a documentary, and um, you asked me to transcribe some uh, tapes, and I was dumb enough to say yes. Um, if if anybody <laughs> out there in nerd world is asked to transcribe hours and hours of tapes, don't do it. So no, no matter how nice that person is. <laughs> Don't do it because it's hard. But, um, yeah, you, you are always passionate about the projects you uh, take on, and I'm always amazed at, at how you do that because you really do become connected to the projects. It's very impressive. Well, thank you, sir. I appreciate it. I do. Well, let's talk about your current project. You currently have a Kickstarter for a new comic book called Safe. I've been independent comics now for about six years, and this is a culmination of a lot of that work. It's um, – it's illustrated by um, my pal, Russ Brown, who worked on my very first comic book with me. Uh, but it's our first kind of large-scale pencil and ink work. It's my first work that's uh, colored um, instead of black and white from beginning to end. Um, and that's by a, a really great local artist named Matt Grigsby. And one of my good buddies who does storyboard work with me for corporations, uh, Tad Galusha, is doing a Dark Horse book now. Is doing uh, did the cover a wraparound, gorgeous wraparound cover, and so in a lot of ways this is kind of a, a culmination of a, a many years of my work. But basically, what I wanted to do was take one of my favorite genres, the the horror zombie genre, and turn it on its head and make something that was really subversive and um, had a couple nice twists, one and done, and just kind of make it as visceral and as uh, as exciting as possible. And so that's what we uh, that's what we've done. We turned in. I mean, the last page of interior art was finished this week. Um, it's being colored as we speak, 
and this sucker will be um, laid out and finalized here before the Kickstarter ends, except for one or two elements that are kind of Kickstarter related. And the other cool thing about it is, is that we're printing it locally and as sustainably as possible. So this isn't being shipped off. Um, we've already been doing tests with an incredible local printer. And um, so this thing will be 100% uh, approved from the cover artist, the artist, the colorist, and myself. And it's, it's going to be pretty special. That's, that's fantastic. Now, um, we know the Killing Jar, which was absolutely gorgeous. Obviously, the writing was fantastic. But like you said, it was black and white. Why the decision to go color? Because I thought black and white was really effective in, in the Killing Jar. Well, I think I appreciate that. You know, one of the cool things, too, about the Kickstarter is that both the Killing Jar and Other Worlds, my two other big series, are part of the campaign. So you can pick those up as well. But the Killing Jar was like by far the worst thing you could do for your first major comic project. It was 240 <laughs> pages long. I mean, it's just insane. And uh, we wanted to go with kind of a 16-millimeter uh, grainy black and white look. So we went straight from the pencils, and we kind of digitally in, in, uh, enhanced the color or the contrast and the tone. Uh, but basically, that was supposed to be raw and, and as visceral as possible to really complement the, the story. It's also, as anybody who's involved in independent comic book knows, uh, extraordinarily cheaper to print in black and white than it is in color. And so that's a huge decision you have to make. It, it, it's just an exorbitant price increase. Um, so we, form and function really came together, both in the Killing Jar and other worlds. But faith needed to be in color. It needed to be bold and bright. And it needed to – color is, in a sense, a character in the, in the piece. And so – there was just no way around it. It had to be um, a color piece. And fortunately, we found uh, another really cool local artist that, that actually illustrated one of my other world stories to, uh, to come in and really knock the colors out of the park. So it's got a very painterly look, and um, I'm very excited for people to see it and, and to see it printed as well as it's going to be printed because it's going to be, like I said, it's going to be gorgeous. Yeah, we, we literally can't wait to see it. Now, you've mentioned, and this is this is not bragging, this is definitely something that um, personally needs to be said, uh, and a little backstory, I guess, to why I want to say it, is you have sort of famous people jumping on Kickstarter, the most recent LeVar Burton with Reading Rainbow, which I think is a great cause. But personally, I sort of have a little bit of trouble with that because it's like he's a known person, he's got a big name, of course he's going to get funded. What about the little guy? The little guy needs more help than LeVar Burton. You have a great track record on Kickstarter. Tell us about that. Well, I think I think crowdsourced funding is an extraordinary thing, and um, I think it's a it's a new tool, and I think that all kinds of people are going to use it and hopefully use it well. And there's been a lot of discussion back and forth about, you know, um, who it should work for and why. But uh, I certainly am not going to tell anybody how they should spend their money. I, I just have always been, from from beginning to end, I've always been about the end product. So much like we talked about earlier, having the work speak for itself, I, I like the I like the the, the fact that I have done several successful independent comic book Kickstarters, that I've never been late, that the product has always been paramount to me, and that I've been remarkably communicative from beginning to end to really kind of stand for itself. And it's a really a great compliment that every time I do a Kickstarter campaign, there's always a, a continuum of folks who followed me from the last one and who often say, here's somebody who stood behind their product, who really cared about it, and who really kept us involved every step of the way. And I think that's an important, um, especially in this day and age when I would say several Kickstarters that I have backed, I have not even heard from the folks when they're done or mm -hmm. when there have been, let's say, issues sometimes with getting the end product. I think that's important to know who it is you're, you're dealing with. And I think I've backed 40-something Kickstarters at this point. I'm maybe addicted to it. In fact, I probably have spent any money over <laughs> over the, the production cost of the books that I've done backing Kickstarter because I think it's such a cool and valuable thing. But so do we I need to start a Kickstarter to support other Kickstarters? Is that what you're saying? <laughs> <laughs> my my habit? I mean, I think that it's a valuable thing. It's a valuable way to put your 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 money where your mouth is, and and it, and as much as possible to be um, to be uh, devoted to the folks who are who are who are putting faith in you in the first place to, to back your Kickstarter. Well, you'll probably have to uh, edit that, but I'll tell you this: it's an extraordinary <laughs> tool, but it's an, it should be a responsibility, I think, to yes. run a Kickstarter. And I think that some people miss that, 
and that's too bad, but it's not me, so no problem there. No, but uh, we get, oh, man, daily we get about 10 requests to promote people's Kickstarters, and we are very selective because of that very reason. We don't want to promote somebody who is not serious about it, and uh, there's about three or four that we usually get second time around they come and ask us, which obviously means they were successful the first time, and we definitely promote them. You probably top of the top of the mountain on that one, so we, we definitely appreciate everything you do, Justin. Um, well, thank going, you. going back to film school, what are some of the things that you learned in film school, specifically film and writing, that you find yourself using as you write comic books? Before I went to film school, I played music a lot. And so many of the so many of the things I learned, both recording in studios and playing live, were important when it came to editing and structure and rhythm of filmmaking. But filmmaking is even bigger, more people involved, more technology, more complication. But at the same time, there's extraordinary possibility. So for me, I learned, and this is part of my personality as well, the balance between making something that you're proud of and that you put everything into but also thinking about the structure, the timeline, the budget, and ultimately a finished product that you show to somebody else. Because unless you want to sit by yourself in the basement in your underwear looking at your own work, eventually it's going to get to a point where you're going to want to let it go mm-hmm. and have other people interact with it. And so there's got to be a balance between that unbridled creativity and that finishing of a project and letting go of it. And film school is very helpful uh, to me in that sense, um, as well as working and, and managing other people and managing yourself. Very cool. So um, we have Safe coming out really soon, and you've worked on other comic books. What? And I know last time you we asked you, you said uh, ElfQuest was a huge influence on you as far as um, what you had read and independent comic books. What other sort of comic books are you currently reading that maybe influence you? Oh, I, I am uh, good friends with uh, Peter and Debbie, who own Excalibur Comics in Portland, Oregon, and um, I love going to the comic book store. I love, I mean, it's, it's celebrating its 40th year this August, and I love just being around comics in general. And so I hear all kinds of comics that I that I read and interact with and kind of adore on a regular basis. I mean, Warren Ellis is probably my favorite writer, though you can't go wrong with your Grant Morrison, um, or Mark uh, Millar, or your kind of Alan Moore when he kind of comes out of the comes out of the ether, <laughs> puts yeah. something out and then disappears again. Um, but you know, I'm 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 in love with most image books that come out. I love independent comics in general, and sometimes there's even the the great superhero tale that um, comes out and really grabs me for whatever reason. So just in general, I think comics are thriving. I think independent comics are um, astoundingly cool. I live in the independent comic book capital of the country, which I'm very grateful for. But every month you can go to the comic book store and read, you know, an impossible array of stuff. And that's, uh, I think that that's, we're very lucky in that. That's a great point. Uh, Here at NerdLocker, we get digital copies of all the comics coming out for the week. And we've been going for about five years. So about the first couple of years, it was awesome. We're like, cool, cool. But then I realized I was missing something because I wasn't going to the actual comic book store just to talk, chat, see what people were doing, see what they were reading, and just being nerding out in the, the comic book store. Since then, you know, quote, unquote, forced myself to go back to the comic book store, which is a true pleasure. You're right. But it, it is, it's an experience. And if there are people out there in nerddom that aren't going to your comic book store just to talk, Please do. It's it's a lot of fun. It's it's something you're in a world that not many people get to enjoy, and you're surrounded by like-minded people. It's very cool. I think it's neat too because it's almost a secret society of entertainment. I mean, yeah. if you sell a best-selling comic book these days, you sell what fifty thousand copies, mm-hmm. and how many people watch the premiere of Two and a Half Men? Twenty million. But yet, those fifty thousand people who read that great Avengers storyline. Uh, they were able to see a world before the billion-dollar franchise was born on the on the screen. So you've got incredible artists and writers creating these almost unknown stories, and you get to encounter those and interact with those long before 
it gets transposed to the to the screen. And it's ex it is an exciting world to be a part of, to, to see that happen every month. And it's mystifying to me that more people aren't reading comics, but enough are that uh, that it's the seed for, like, all kinds of other entertainment. And heck, yeah, go every month and, and, and see the world before anybody else, you know, gets to. It's, it's, it's great. Yeah, I, I, I couldn't agree more. Um, sort of along those lines, we are, I mean, it's, God, it's been two years, and we're still seeing more and more comic book movies come out more frequently. What are your opinions on some of these that have come out that are, um, I wouldn't say straight adaptations, but really close adaptations of the books like Days of Future Past and The Winter Soldier? Have you seen those? I, I, I watch movies probably less than I used to, and if, if, if you remember much about me, I'm trying to be... Uh, egocentric about anything. It's just I just don't have as much time as I used mm -hmm. to. And so also I found that when I'm when I'm writing things or I'm creating things, it's good almost not to try to compare to compare them. So I'm from a from a filmmaking cinema background, but I love writing comics and I'm trying to become more focused as a comic book writer. So I don't I'm not the first person to run out and watch a, a comic book movie. That said, anything that captures popular imagination, anything that gets people into the comic book world Anything that uh, strikes a chord in an audience, I'm completely, uh, completely happy about. To me, I think a comic book movie is uh, about as general as I, I read comic books. There are all different kinds of comic book movies. Uh, there was, I mean, um, uh, there have been some incredible quote-unquote comic book movies that are some of the best drama of, dramas of our time, but people don't know that they're based on comic books. Mm -hmm. And the same thing applies with I read comic books. Some people will think of, you know, the Avengers, and other people will think of the craziest Warren Ellis thing they've ever read before. So, you know, my opinion basically is that anything that gets people excited about storytelling and and uh, in particular comic books is a good thing. It's funny that you say that. We actually had a discussion um, at Nerd Locker about are you really spoiling the movie if you've read the comic book and you know what's going to happen and you still want to see it, but you know what's going to happen versus the person who had no clue that this was based on a comic book and thinks you spoiled it because you gave a review of the comic book. Specifically, we were talking about Winter Soldier and the identity of the Winter Soldier, and people were a little frustrated. We were talking about, well, is it really a spoiler or isn't it a spoiler? It's been out there for you know several years. Maybe you should go see the Did book. You Did you know it was on a book? It was interesting. Yeah, it is it just me, or are people a little bit more angry than they need to be? Yeah, I, I think so, too. And we've we've also had this discussion with Game of Thrones. It's like the books have been out there for several years now. So <laughs> if somebody ruins the, the show for you on Sunday and you get mad on Facebook, it's like, it's a book. It's been there. Somebody could have ruined it for you years ago. So calm down. It's okay. It's still entertainment. We do live in an interesting world. People take these things remarkably seriously, but at the same time, they have the ability to disconnect around things that um, are important to them. So it's, it's, uh, I wouldn't consider it fair to be upset at uh, my good buddy uh, Jimmy because he reviewed <laughs> something using existing source material in which to compare and contrast. Uh, that's actually, I would say, 100% your job. So, uh, so yeah, you're you're good with me, but uh, but uh, the other folks, I don't know, man. Be careful, it's an angry, it's an angry world out there. Nerves be tripping. So last <laughs> time we talked, last time we talked, you mentioned that, um, and you may not have seen these, but Straw Dogs and Old Boy were two of your favorite movies. Since that oh, time, we gosh. have two remakes. Now, <laughs> what are your opinions on those? Oh, look, see, now you did find something that kind of pisses me off a little bit. Yeah, I mean, it's, again, um, Old Boy would be a, an example, too, of uh, some uh, a comic book movie, right? I mean, substantially different than the source material, but yeah. um, but a lot of that came through. Uh, but, yeah, I mean, it's too bad, maybe, that people, and you're talking to somebody who loves 60s and 70s cinema as you know, the favorite, favorite form of cinema. Like, those are my... You know, I'll, I'll give me give me Straw Dogs or Dog Day Afternoon or uh, Midnight Cowboy or, I mean, my goodness, the, the greatest um, action adventure horror, the greatest uh, dramas. Um, that's my that's my preferred era of filmmaking right there. And it's too bad that we have to go back and kind of maliciously transpose that onto a onto a new 
onto a new era when the original piece uh, was re- was so remarkably strong. But again, it's not like anybody's going out and burning all my old copies of uh, of these great films. I mean, they're there for people to explore. I just I just wish people were a little more excited about um, interacting with those kind of great pieces and then doing something, anything new. But maybe that's why we have so many comic book movies because people realize that hey, there is a whole untapped world of storytelling, and let's uh, let's get that on and on a regular basis. Well, we've been doing this for a while now, and I was I was actually shocked about this news. They're remaking Cliffhanger. <laughs> we yeah, that's exactly guys, what I thought. <laughs> we have two little guys, uh, uh, Gannon and Kellen Door, and uh, they come over. We play we play video games, and they're they're buddies of mine. Um, and I showed them, no joke, a Stallone double feature a couple weeks ago. I showed them Judge <laughs> Dredd because they've seen the new Judge Dredd. And I showed him Demolition Man, and Demolition Man holds up. I was yeah. surprised. It was uh, it was it was still effective to this day, which means they're going to be remaking that soon. But Rennie Harlan's Cliffhanger is not, I think, one of Stallone's better films. However, uh, my buddy Tad loves Stallone, and we watched that uh, we watched that on Blu-ray, and so there is a it, everything does come full circle. I can't believe they're remaking that movie, but it doesn't <laughs> surprise. Yeah, we felt the same way. If you bring John Lithgow back as a bad guy, all right, but let's let's think about the rest of the cast, please. I really like the 70 millimeter. I mean, they actually took out a, a 65 to 70 millimeter camera and did a lot of that exterior stuff. But uh, really, the wow, is that absurd? Oh yeah, yeah. There's it's you know extraordinarily the 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 location stuff extraordinarily filmed. Everything yeah. else, not so much. So I remember seeing some Facebook. Facebook's updates not too long ago from you with the next gen video game consoles. What are you into? Yeah, so I mean, I have an Xbox One, and it's not like Microsoft customer service. Oh, I could go on, <laughs> on about this stuff forever. I mean, it's depressing how because I love video games. I think I've been playing video games since the Atari Twenty Six Hundred, and I think they're extraordinary possibility for for telling stories and for for interactive experiences and. Most of the time, they just descend into somebody running around blowing people up. And Tom Bissell is one of the greatest writers about video games I've ever read. He's, you know, he he summarizes so many of my feelings uh, much better than I ever could. But you know, I I play a lot of video games because I think that they're they're incredible, and I think the potential is incredible. But I also play them because a lot of my friends are online, and sometimes we have business meetings while we're blowing each other up in Halo <laughs> or whatnot. And and there's a there's also a kind of a visceral release where sometimes I, I don't know about you but you have a tough week or whatever and you sit back with your friends in the evening and you just kind of blow stuff up. It's uh it's a nice way to kind of get out some some stress. So yeah, I, I'm an Xbox One guy simply because all my friends were have been Xbox since the first Xbox and um, I'm waiting for Destiny like everybody else. I've killed more people in Titanfall than you can imagine, but the games I'm most excited about are the ones they haven't talked about yet. Like, I cannot wait for the next Fallout. Cannot wait. Um, Very that's, cool. That's what I'm excited about. Yeah, I have were to you, agree Were you. you online? Um, I, I am, um, I'll be old man dad here, and I have a PS3 that I thoroughly enjoy. Um, <laughs> I, uh, <laughs> I stick to, uh, well, actually, uh, Allison got me, my wife got me uh, Deadpool the Game, which was, I won't say it's the best video game ever made, but it is very entertaining. It's very inappropriate. Um, definitely after hours. I just I love that game for no no real good reason. It doesn't even tell a great story, but it's funny and I enjoy it. And there's a lot of violence. Um, but then I, I love the Call of Duty series. It's just you have a bad day and you just go online and I have 13 year old kids killing me left and right. But at the same time, I get a lucky <laughs> shot in here and there and feel good about myself. So yeah, I I totally agree with you that you can just uh, get some release there by. By playing video games, I think uh, I think Daniel Way, the comic book writer, wrote uh, Deadpool. So there you, there you, there's another way that comic book comic book folks have infiltrated, you know, the the, the other other realms. I mean, obviously based on a comic book character, but you know, for me, I, I look back at video games and and I and I see a really I see an evolution of games to come, just like the comic books have evolved um, in terms of the the, the quality and uh, consistency. And uh, I would say the diversity. 
um, I'm hoping to see that in video games, but, you know, I remember games like Set the First Silent Hill or Shadow of the Colossus or the first Metro when that came out um, mm-hmm. of, of nowhere. And, and you see some of those incredible, um, some, of the, some of that evolution kind of happening in my lifetime. And I think in games we're going to see uh, a, a, some really remarkable things yet to come for, for both for both old man Palmquist and uh, old man Zimmerman. <laughs> I think we're going to see some incredible things in, in the comic book realm, but in the, the game realm too. I completely agree. I was floored. Uh, we were filming Nerdlocker the other day, and I'm just sitting there watching Cubby play uh, Watch Dogs. And I'm like, okay, whatever, not terribly interested. But he goes from a car into a water taxi, and there doesn't seem to be any end to this world. And I just remember the old days, you'd be playing a game and you'd either literally hit a wall and you couldn't go any further, or like uh, Star Fox, you'd go and then it'd shoot you back out. You had no choice. You were turning around and it's like, it's unbelievable to me that the video game didn't seem to have any end. You could go as far as you wanted. That was crazy. The the cool thing about comics and video games is that because they're such a, like a socially maligned uh, form of entertainment, you can get away with almost anything which gives you a huge amount of freedom and lets you take, you know, and it enables you to take giant risks. I mean, that goes in film when you go back to the horror genre and even, you know, back to Safe and Romero and, and Zombies, and, and you see all of the incredible social criticism, not only in Romero, but in horror films from the beginning that got kind of embedded in the form of that, 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 that movie genre because nobody cared. But you talk about Watch Dogs, that, that game is coming up uh, against some real – I think valuable criticism about how it handles its, its female characters, how it handles um, minority characters, and in some ways there's this again extraordinary world building and possibility. And in other ways, a responsibility for for cool stories and cool characters and, and cool situations is just not coming through. People haven't been able to elevate, at least in a lot of cases, the story or the script or the overarching narrative. Uh, in these games to the extent that they've been able to elevate the technical prowess. And it's going to be a cool space for people who really love storytelling to hopefully start or continue to uh, kind of take over, just like what's been going on with comic books. I mean, comic books are not are not simple. Uh, they don't have to be simple. They can be uh, drawn by every person from every ethnicity, from every background. They can be written across the across the spectrum, and they are. But you're not seeing a lot of that in video games yet, just because they're so difficult to make and they're so expensive. But I think we're going to get more and more of that as we go. No, you bring up a good point. We recently did an interview, and I can't remember the gentleman's name, but he spoke to that, that he ha- that you have these video games. Like, you have your Maddens, you have your Call of Duties, you have your Grand Theft Autos, which are just the, the, the top of the top as far as earners go and the amount of money it costs to make them. And then you have sort of your basic low-key ones that usually make it on your phones or what have you, but the middle ground for video games really isn't there anymore, and that is sort of um, sort of what, kind of what I think what you're talking about with that independent comic book where you need to fill that gap so you get more diversity, and I think you're right. I think comic books, we're seeing that where, um, you know, kind of self-publishing is almost, I wouldn't say easy, but it's far less expensive than trying to make your movie or trying to get a video game made so that you can. You can put your comic book, your story together and get it out there for the world to see. I remember when I was a kid, there was a local comic book owner that made his own comic, and I think he had to order like 5,000 of them to make it. Make yeah. It. Now if you can turn a PDF into a, into an online printer, um, you can make a single copy of your comic book. Before I had actually started making uh, The Killing Jar, I went to a local comic book convention and Brian Michael Bennis was there. He was big, but it wasn't like he was, you know, big like he is now where he's pretty much single-handedly writing event event mm-hmm. series for, for Marvel. Yeah. And he was extraordinarily positive. Um, an Ohio guy. Um, both of us spent some time in Ohio, but he, he was working for a decade in Ohio independent comics and um, owning his storytelling shops before it became the overnight sensation. I mean, a 10-year in the making overnight sensation. But well, the long and the short was is that he said, listen, you make a comic book, you're in the comic book industry. You are part of this form. And he just had a TED Talk worth looking up as well, I think in Cleveland. And he said much wow. the same thing. And uh, it's 
it was very helpful to me because I had so much to learn and so much to, and I still have so much to still learn, frankly. But you learn by doing. And in this form, you know, you, you can. Uh, you can make a comic book in a way that it's, it's much easier to make a comic book page than it is to shoot a, a second of film or, you know, to, to, to put on a stage play or whatnot. You get together with your, your artist friend or, or if you can do it all yourself and you, you make something. And uh, you publish it and then you go sit down and you show it to people. And um, that's, pretty, that's pretty astounding. Uh, I mean, a good, a, a pretty large corporate job responsibility came to me because I had been making independent comic books. I had worked in one aspect of my life as a corporate uh, individual, and on the other hand, I had created all of these independent pieces with a variety of different artists. And that culmination, someone said, this person is ready for this kind of project management um, uh, job. And so you don't do things because you think you're going to get rich. You do them because they're valuable to you. But if you put time and energy into something, people will see that and recognize it. And you are then a comic book maker. And that's exactly what we love about the comic book industry and talking to artists and writers, creators, is you never hear somebody, yeah, I got into this and my dad was in it and sort of the family business and I didn't really want to do it. It's like, no, people who are in the comic industry are passionate people. They have stories they want to tell or they have artistic talents that they want to put out there. And that's, I just love it. I love talking with our uh, comic book people. I don't know about you, but my parents still don't understand what I do for a living. <laughs> no. They got no, it when I was a professor, right? But yeah. everything else, they're like, so you write what for what? You know, you make films for what? You know, it's very difficult to, to connect. What, what about you, dude? How do you, how do you explain it? Oh, yeah. I get uh, – my dad will have a client or somebody come in and like, yeah, I told him all about Nerd Locker. And I'm like, what would you tell him, Dad? It's like, well, that you do reviews and stuff. And I'm like, what's the stuff, Dad? It's like, um, yeah, you do nerd locker. And I'm like, that's right, Dad. Thanks, buddy. And it's, it's cute because you see them trying, but they just don't understand because it, it, it wasn't it wasn't available to them to do these things, you know, way back in the day. So having these possibilities be open to them is is new. And it's, it's I mean, like you said earlier, it's happened in our lifetime. That's crazy. It's uniquely ours. And I think that's, that's what makes it extraordinary, gives us a special sense of responsibility, but it's also, you know, it enables you to tell hopefully stories that nobody else has told before and, or in new ways. And I think that's always what, what gets me up in the morning is trying to do something new or interesting or of value um, on, a, on a daily basis, for sure. And I, and I definitely like to put in a plug for us born in 77. We are true children of the 80s. You would not believe some of these younger nerds who were talking. is like, you guys have no idea. If you didn't grow up in the 80s, I think you kind of missed something because nerd wasn't always a good thing, literally. And it was you, you kind of got picked on if you talked about, you know, certain movies or whatever. But now it's so cool. Everybody wants to be in it. You got MTV Geek. You got the LA Times doing Hero Complex. It's like awesome. I'm, I'm glad it's become popular, but it certainly wasn't always that way. Well, I, I, I want a world of diversity. I want a world of different stories. I, I want a world where people can be themselves and not have to have someone have to be scared someone's going to beat them up for it. I mean, I think that we, and, and every subsequent generation is saying this, we're much more tolerant, we're much more thoughtful. And, you know, I, there's a lot of people who bemoan the future. But I'll tell you, um, in ter- even in terms of video games, like a whole generation of people who don't think that a problem is unsolvable because they play video games, so they know there's a way to do it. They know yeah. there's a way to beat that level. They just don't know how yet. So they're going to keep working on it until they figure it out. That's incredible to me. I, yeah. I, you know, it's it's exciting. And so these are forms that I think are are important, and I think are 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 pretty um, are pretty young yet. And it's it's fun to be playing around with them. It's fun to be doing podcasts. It's fun to be interviewing people. It's fun to be talking. It's fun to be making work. It's uh, it's an exciting time. It's it's unbelievably fun. So Justin safe. Anything else you want to tell us other than go to the Kickstarter page, which we will definitely have the link on the page, but anything else you want to talk about? No, I mean, I, I just appreciate the the time. Uh, I would say that we just want to make the coolest thing we possibly can and we want to get it to as many people as we possibly can independently and thus safe is on Kickstarter and uh, anybody has any questions, 
and you know where to find me. Excellent. Justin, thank you so much for jumping on Nerd Locker with us and talking about your project. Can't tell you how much we appreciate that. We will definitely have you back in the future. Well, thank you, pal. I, I do appreciate it. I appreciate you spreading the word about all these cool things. It's uh, pretty awesome. Thank you, sir.